I'm Luke Imhoff. I'm known across the internet as Chronic Death. I work at Dockyard in the R&D department. I created IntelliJ Elixir, the Elixir plugin for JetBrains IDEs like IntelliJ, RubyMine, WebStorm, PHP Storm, etc. This is things you might not have tried with Ecto. And as Jim says, maybe you shouldn't be doing. Uh, the techniques and examples I'm about to show you were gathered while working on Block Scout, an open source Ethereum blockchain explorer. The project is sponsored by POA Network. The work was a collaboration between POA Network and some of the big names in Elixir, Dockyard, Gaslight, and Platform Attack. The examples will be specific to the project in this domain, but the techniques apply to any complex domain that needs to ingest millions to hundreds of millions of rows of data in days instead of months. Even before the split of Ecto into Ecto and Ecto SQL in version 3, Ecto could be used with or without a database, as uh, Greg demonstrated. Without a database, Ecto can still be used for casting and validation. When I say casting with Ecto, you probably think of Ecto change set and Ecto change set cast, as we saw in the last talk. But that's not the source of Ecto's casting. Instead, Ecto change set cast is internally using something called Ecto type. Ecto type is a behavior of five callbacks cast, dump, equals A, load, and type. I always forget if the callbacks are talking about the external elixir or adapter type, so I made this nice table. Cast converts external input, usually strings, to an elixir type. Dump takes the elixir type and passes it to the adapter's type, and load does the opposite of dump. If you're wondering how the callbacks are used when there is a database, for insert, you're taking the external input, casting to elixir, and then dumping to the database adapter. For read operations like git and all, you're reading the adapter type from the database and loading it into the Elixir type. Updates are combining the type from the adapter by loading and the external input through casting. If the Elixir type is like decimal and normal double equals does not work for comparison, the optional equals A callback can be implemented. If the values are equal, no change is recorded, so no updates happen. Otherwise, the change goes to the database. Now that you've seen how ectotype is used, let's see an actual example. Our use case is converting hashes. Hashes are hexadecimal so that people can read them, but the hash itself is really a run of bytes. So in Elixir, we have the better representation as a binary. We're not using a database yet, but for the adapter, this would be binary or byte A for Postgres, which is short for byte array. So binaries are great for pattern matching in Elixir, but they have some problems. Our project was using Phoenix for the UI, so we'd like the Elixir type to be able to implement string cares, Phoenix HTML safe, and Phoenix params. We'd also like to restrict the length. I say restrict because we want to be sure that the length can't be created wrong, not only validate the length from user input. Moving the length check into the type also ensures that it's consistent everywhere. We, can, we can't forget a validate length call for a schema's cast function. To be able to implement protocols that aren't just on the generic binary type, we need the Elixir representation to be a struct, so we wrap the original binary in a hash struct. The bytes binary has a size that can be pattern matched out, but we want to prevent incorrectly sized binaries from being directly set in the hash, so we also record the expected byte count in the struct. This caught some bugs where we mixed up hashes of different sizes, usually due to copy and paste errors. We had three sizes of hashes for four different usages. Full 32-byte hashes are used for primary keys for blocks of transactions and transactions themselves. Hashes truncated to 20 bytes are used for addresses which represent individual people or a collective of people represented by a contract. Hashes truncated to 16 bytes are called nonces and used as proof of work for a miner to show that they found a number that when concatenated with the block will prefix the new hash with a certain number of zeros. Yes, that's what cryptocurrency money is based on, is finding the number of zeros in a prefix. The hash module itself defines the shared hash struct. Because the multiple sizes, we made the hash module be pluggable as behavior. The implementation modules, such as Hashful, implement the byte count callback to restrict the byte count field to a specific value. Here we see Hashful. It implements the byte count callback for the hash behavior to restrict it down from 1 to 32 to exactly 32. The Ecto callbacks then defer to the hash module. So that hashful is both implementing the ecto type behavior and the 
explorer chain hash behavior. It is possible for one module to implement any number of behaviors as long as the actual callbacks do not overlap in name and arity. Let's first look at hash cast 2, which allows our callback modules to implement ectotype cast 1, but with a specific byte count. The first type of input, which all ectotype cast implementations must handle, is the values already cast. The reason why this is useful is if you think about when you're normally writing your tests, you're not putting in the stringly typed value for testing your change set functions or your type functions. You're putting in like a full blown struct or a full blown ecto date. And if you didn't have it by default that cast could do this, you'd have to always pass in the stringly typed value. You can see the double check of the byte count in the pattern, checking both the byte count field and the byte size in the binary pattern. The calling code can't force hashes of internally inconsistent size or that differ from the declared size of the field in the ecto schema module, once again protecting us from copy paste errors both in our tests and when creating new schemas. The second input was a plain binary, which we need to handle to interact with other APIs. We ended up storing a lot of hashes and ETS tables, and storing just the binary instead of the struct saved a lot of memory. The binary size can be checked against the required byte count for the hash implementation. The third input is what you're thinking of as a hash. It's a human readable OX prefix hexadecimal string. It calls cast hexadecimal digits. We want the bytes as output, and we want to skip first having to make an integer, then converting that to bytes, so we can use base decode 64, which efficiently goes from a hexadecimal encoding to a binary. It's a really cool pattern match setup and a very short code. It's worth reading. The fourth input to cast is a normal Elixir integer. It calls cast integer. When casting from an integer, the important thing is to check the range. As the binary syntax will silently throw away bits of an integer that don't fit the given size and inputs, there is no overflow exception for constructed binaries, only for pattern matching. We don't really expect user external inputs to be integers, as it's not really correct to think of a collection of bytes as one continuous number, but it makes tests easier, because we can use a sequence to generate incremental numbers and then cast to a hash. The final input type is a catch-all that returns error, as your cast callbacks need to avoid throwing exceptions and instead return error for any unrecognized inputs. If it threw exceptions, change that cast wouldn't work. It would just crash the app. After cast, the next callback is dump. Dump is simpler. We only need to extract the bytes for the binary format using the adapter. The comment hints, though, at a bug that needs to be prevented, copy pasta for the wrong hash type being directly set, as happened in some of our tests. Using the wrong type of hash could make the test fail or, more perniciously, accidentally pass. Load approaches the bug from the other direction. We have a lot of data and a lot of ways to write it. In some cases, we're using SQL to directly set one field from another, such as when doing data migrations that involve foreign keys. We want the ectotype at runtime to verify data to catch mistakes in other parts of the code as early as possible. Wait, wait, OK. I said ectotype was useful when you don't have a database, but I showed dump and load, which is a database. So how do we use hash full cast without the database? We use it to check inputs without round tripping to the database. This pre-check is important because repo git and repo all don't pass through a change set. So we would have passed bad inputs. It also means we can use the hashes to do lookups in non nectar data stores like ETS, as I mentioned before, or remote API calls. <laughs> Let's move on from without a database to when we are using a database. You can't have a database without for creating it, so a logical point for talking about Ecto with a database is the migrations. Create table creates a default primary key called ID. In Postgres, it's what's called a serial. A serial is an automatically incrementing big int, knowing this is important in cases where you need to add the primary key to a table later that didn't have it. If you just add a big int, you're going to keep being the same number or no default. And serial is very special in that it's going to be a cast type integer on the system, so you will always get a different integer for every transaction. The only one got you is you always get even if your transaction fails, so you might have gaps with your primary IDs if you ever notice that. When we want a non-integer primary key, such as a binary hash or a UUID, we need to tell create table to not create that default primary key, but then mark the field that is a primary key instead. This also works for composite primary keys. You can take more than one column as primary key true, and they will turn to a composite primary key. 
This example about the internal transactions also shows that a column can both be a foreign key using references and a primary key or part of a composite primary key at the same time. A brief interlude to explain some terminology. A block is a batch of transactions. Think about this like the work that the bank does when they're processing all the, your checking account at the end of the day and reconciling. The blockchain is like Git in that any block hash includes the hash of the previous block or the parent. The blockchain being eventually consistent means that different parts of the network can think they represent the consensus. Ethereum, as part of its design, decided to pay people that pick the incorrect fork by allowing those blocks to be included as what's called uncles on the consensus linked list. The important part is that the correct block is the nephew while the incorrect block is the uncle. We care to track this information as a tax on the network can be tracked by seeing if a transaction appears both in an uncle and a consensus block. This is important because there actually was a consensus attack on what's called Ethereum Classic, where over 50% 50 plus one node was taken over by one group of miners, and they tried to double spend. In our project, we need to track the relationship between uncle and nephew blocks. Because the relationship is many to many, we need a join table. Neither foreign key is really primary, so neither has primary key true option. Instead, we need to simulate what primary key would do manually. Null false on the columns and a unique index on all ordered pairs of the foreign keys to the join table. The order of the keys matters for Postgres using an index. There must be a prefix of keys that match the planned join order because the join needs to be able to select a subtree of the index for it to be efficient. So most of the indices are B tree or GIST, like it is some sort of tree. So for Postgres to pick the index, it can't be something where it has to look at all the leaves or the index is no more efficient than a sequential scan. Um, so like it has to be in the same order, which means that if you have multiple keys, you have to do every permutation of the order that you think you're actually going to do to do a query. You may have noticed that the nephew hash is a foreign key using references, while uncle hash is only a byte A. This is because we're getting the data from a remote API. So we know about the nephew is connected to the uncle. So we know like the real block that everyone has agreed with where money was supposed to be sent is somehow connected to an uncle where someone made a mistake. Before we necessarily know about that uncle, because it's not really on the blockchain anymore, we don't get it by default from the stream of like new blocks. And that means our data isn't fully linked. And that's why I call this a lazy join table, as the uncles are lazily fetched asynchronously. To keep track that we haven't fetched the uncle yet, we can't use the uncle hash column because we do get the uncle's hash from the remote API. Instead, we have a separate column that marks when we did the fetch. We need a way to efficiently query for the nephews that don't have their uncles fetched. We set up a partial index, which is an index with a where clause for all rows that have uncle fetched at as null. We came to this pattern of null timestamp with a partial index for reboot recovery after first trying anti-joins, where you check, like, you do a left join, and you're like, if this one side is null, then oh, it must be missing. Turns out, doesn't scale really well at millions of rows. So for five to seven million rows in the box table, the partial index, few seconds, tens of seconds, tens of minutes for the anti-join. The same thing for an accept clause. I tried a lot of different Stack Overflow answers of how to do this, and this was the one way that was actually performant. You don't have to directly index the columns value, and instead can index any value computed from the columns of the row. We create a unique index on the lowercase version of the username to allow case preserving of the display, but case insensitive uniqueness without the need to change the collation of the columns. So this would be sort of like how Max file system works where like, it'll preserve your capitalization of your keynote presentation, but it won't let you name something with a different uh, capitalization. You may have noticed that we've seen the timestamp type, UTC, daytime, USAC already. For the more standard timestamps call, the type key is used to override the default type. By default, null false is set, but I've gotten the habit of explicitly putting null false or null true in migrations for fields to show that I thought explicitly about the nullability of the column. Because otherwise, if you just do the default, people are going to be like, did we actually think this design through? It doesn't really matter for timestamps, but for every other column, it's something you should be doing null true or null false. Don't just leave off null true because that's the default. Because most times, you're probably going to want to be explicitly saying why you want null true, and really null false is the thing you're going to want. So it's important to put that in there and maybe comment why you have null true or false. Without the type option, the ectotype is 
naive date time. If you want Elixir to know the database is UTC, you need to use an explicit UTC date time for the Ecto type, and then you'll be able to use date time in Elixir. In Ecto 3, the usex suffix was added to say you expect microseconds to be included, as not all data stores could track microseconds. Assuming that microseconds worked was an Ecto 2x bug. Because we had multiple writers reaching the same table over multiple code paths, we wanted to make sure that the database was enforcing any validations as constraints. This starts simple enough. For domain example, a transaction can be pending, in which case it isn't associated with a block. Or it is not pending and assigned to a denormalized block number. Unlike validations that can be skipped, because of imperative logic in your schema function, like a literal if or an unless, check constraints are always run. There must always be a way to calculate true in any valid state and false in any invalid state. There's no way to be skip this constraint, I don't care. You can end up with some pretty complex rules if your table represents multiple states for a single field, such as here for a status. I got in the habit of writing out the truth table to check my work so I could explain how each combination of columns could occur. But a truth table would require a lot of ands and ors to do the full conjunction of disjunctions or disjunctions of conjunctions. So I used a Carnot map to simplify the tables to the minimum column checks. Finally, I left those truth tables and Carnot maps in the comments in the migration so anyone later could check the logic, as we had a lot of bugs around these complex fields like status. This might also happen to you if you have status for payment processing with an external um, payment provider like PayPal. Beyond check constraints, Postgres supports exclusion constraints. Exclusion constraints are a generalization of unique indices in that they can use any operator instead of only equality. Exclusion constraints differ, though, from check constraints because exclusion constraints can compare multiple rows, while check can only see one row. By using a GIS index, we can apply the exclusion to more complex types like ranges, uh, TS vectors, which are the um, the type used when you want to do full text analysis using Postgres and not using Elasticsearch, and the INET types, which are great for doing um, uh, like IP address ranges. You can create an exclusion constraint using a GIS index and the AND AND operator on a range type. AND AND checks for overlap. For us, that was an int 8 type because we cared about the values assigned to a range of blocks. This ensured we didn't have multiple rewards for the same block number without having to list out the reward for all 7 million blocks now and into the future, or do a sequential scan to check for collisions inside a trigger when we use two columns instead of a range. So in previous projects, when I've had a range of times and I didn't know range types existed in Postgres, I was having the two being separate columns. And that means you're doing a read against the database to scan to see if you have any overlap. So you're always doing a se sequential scan, which is terribly unperformant. This also works for time spans if you use a date range type. This can prevent double booking of people or resources. Moving out of the setup of the database with migrations, we start the actual work of inserting, updating, and reading the data. Our application functioned as a way of caching and exploring data from an external API. So that means we had an extract, transform, and load, or ETL process. That involved bulk operations on the database instead of single row operations. Ecto bulk operations all have the all suffix. Looking at the arguments, none of the operations take change sets, which means we can't pass change sets and get validations back. Focusing on insert all, entries can either be a map or keyword list of field names pointing to their value. We would like these fields to be validated first, so how do we do that? Let's plan out our API. We want to specify the Ecto schema module that has this change set function once. Unlike the change set function, though, we don't want to pass one map params, but a whole list of maps. We also need a way to call a change set function that isn't called change set. So we take inspiration from Ecto's other APIs and add a with option to override the change set function name. This is used on associations in uh, Ecto schemas. We're going to extract our arguments and options, validate with the change set function, and reduce the change set to a single OK or error tuple. Let's zoom in to see those steps in detail. This is still pretty dense, so let's fill in with some specifics. We'll change Ecto schema module to address. We'll then fill in the atom change set for the change set function name. Now that the module and function are no longer variables, we can replace apply with a normal call, which makes it more obvious that we're validating each map of params in a list separately, and we'll end up with a stream of change sets. We need to convert those change sets in either 
into either an error or an OK tuple. We're going to use an all or nothing approach. So if we encounter an invalid change set, we switch to an error. We went with this approach because otherwise we would have to have figured out how to break the data dependencies between different tables once we found an error in one specific table. From then on, we ignore any valid change sets and only accumulate more errors. The only way to exit the reduce with an OK tuple is for all change sets to be valid. We can extract out the map that insert all needs from the changes field in the change set. Since we only want a map and not a struct, this is a slightly faster way than doing apply action. Although, to be honest, until Greg taught us, I didn't know about apply action. With the list of changes maps, we can call insert all. We had multiple tasks running this insert all, and the remote API could supply the information for this table to any number of those tasks. So we ran into errors like this, where we're violating unique constraints. Because insert all doesn't use change set, there's no support built into Ecto to convert this Postgrex error back to a change set error the way you could do ASOC constraint if we we're using change sets for just plain insert. Thankfully, insert all supports a conflict target and on conflict option, so we can convert that insert into an upsert. This works for Postgres, MySQL, not just Mongo. Mongo came up with the term upsert, but normal databases support it now. Using replace all for on conflict led to a problem where foreign key constraints thought we were deleting the reference primary key. The executor doesn't check whether the value is the same or not. All it cares is that the column in the row is being set. When this happened, we shifted away from last write wins and instead thought of specific business rules about how each column should update. The general structure of of an on-conflict Ecto query is a from of the insert table with a nested update set. The individual set arguments are updates to columns. One useful one is using coalesce to pick the non-null values. Although coalesce is supported in Ecto3, Ecto3 does not understand the excluded meta variable. So we use fragment so we can use SQL directly. We need to use question mark, mark to bind in address contract code, because Ecto aces tables to short names like A0 or T0, which we can't guess cleanly if these queries are nested. The excluded meta variable represents a fake table. Its purpose is to hold the single row that was excluded from being inserted. The columns in the excluded reflect the row immediately before they replace the current row. So if you have before insert triggers, those have already fired. It is so ready for insert that if you take all the excluded column values, it is the same as doing replace all. But of course, use replace all because replace all is a string that just says replace all. And doing all the excluded ones is you're sending more data to the database to do the same thing. So use replace all if you can. The other pattern that we found useful was to correlate updates. In this case, we're using greatest on the fetch coin balance block number to take the most recent block number between what was already in the database and was being inserted. Greatest is a nice operator that lets you take the max of two values on the same row, as opposed to max itself, which takes the max of two values on the same column. We use case to emulate an argmax, that is taking the value from the current row or the excluded row that matches the one taken by greatest below. This lets us pick the value for the greatest block number. This way, we take the most recent value in real time and what time that was instead of last write wins, which may not match real time because distributed systems and multiple writing tasks. This would be similar to ensuring that your checking account shows the most recent balance and when that balance was last updated on an account summary page at your bank. Great, that fixed everything. Nope. We now got this error. Even though OnConflict deals with a row already existing, Postgres does not let a duplicate row in the same insert statement as it is, assumes that you likely have a bug. Like this is. This is so important that Postgres actually has one of those note things in its docs for like bad stuff is happening if you see this. And it's like, we don't do this because it makes it non-deterministic. So how do we get around this? We started to use maps and map sets with explicit merge rules to ensure that we couldn't have duplicate params before calling changes list. I recommend avoiding enum unique by because it throws away the differences on the non-unique keys, which can hide bugs earlier in the ETL process. In our specific case, we had so many code paths before being able to generate address references that the code for extraction was moved into a separate module. Uh, this was a platform text idea. It was a great idea. So the rules could remain consistent. It was important that the Elixir merge rules for any two addresses use the same logic 
as the on conflict option passed to insert all. So whether a conflict was detected in Elixir or SQL, it would be resolved the same. This unfortunately means that you have to write the same code in either Ecto DSL or actual SQL and in Elixir for merging maps. And you just have to remember those have to stay synced. We got rid of the unique index violations and duplicate row errors, but we hit deadlocks. I didn't even think deadlocks were possible in Postgres's multi-version concurrency controller MVCC. To fix the deadlocks, we had to make sure that the insert alls in the different tasks wrote the rows in the same order, which means picking an arbitrary order and sorting all the rights to the same table in that order. The order is arbitrary because the unique key of an address or most of our tables is a hash. And hashes, by their nature, are secure random numbers. They don't, they're not really supposed to be ordered. If you'd like more details of how I figured this out, I wrote a blog post about it and it is available on the Dockyard blog at the link below. So far, I've only shown a single insert all which can only insert into a single table. To insert into multiple tables in one transaction, you can use ActoMulti. ActoMulti has similar functions to ActoRepo. For bulk operations, the functions we care about are delete all, insert all, update all, and run. All steps of a multi need, to use, need a user-specified name that is unique. Multi, thankfully, will check that you don't have any overlaps when the multi is actually ran, though. Those names are used for keys in the changes so far map that is used for multi-run. Multi-run is the most flexible step for a multi. It can be used to take the output of any previous step and do dependent database operations, but multi-run doesn't even need to affect the database. It can run anything, which can include updating ETS tables or doing remote API interactions that should still be transactional. Multi is like stream in that it doesn't do anything until passed to a different API. So as Greg said, this is a command struct. In stream's case, those are enum functions. In multi's case, it is calling repo transaction. Part of using Ecto Multi or any operations in the same transaction is ensuring the ordering. Primary keys need to be inserted before current foreign keys that point to those primary keys. Because we're doing bulk operations, sometimes the primary keys that are referenced may be in the same transaction, and sometimes they may have happened before. But we need to make sure that the order works whether they come in a uh, database transaction before or in the same one. As long as you're using references in your migrations and true foreign key constraints in your database, it shouldn't be possible to have data dependency loops. The order of your multi-steps should be able to match the order of the migrations that set up the tables, as you can't create a table with a foreign key to a non-existent table. Having all the tables validation and multi-calls in one module led to over 1,500 lines of code in one file. Inside the file, there was a lot of repeat patterns, which to me screamed for a refactoring opportunity to extract <coughs> modules and a behavior. The Ecto schema module callback is used by the validation later to validate params across all runners before any runner is run using a lot of the hidden functions that Greg showed us. This ensures we don't eat up database resources for a transaction that will fail partway through due to validation errors. Our database during most of the boot process when we're collecting all of the how many years of history runs at like 60 to 80% load. So any load we can eliminate from the database is a godsend. The run callback mimics multi-run, but simplifies the process in that only changes list for the specific Ecto multi module is passed to the callback instead of each runner having to pick out their correct changes. And we can do this because we know the Ecto schema module name. Since the run callback both takes in and returns a multi, it doesn't have to do a single multi operation, but any number of them. We found chaining operations around the actual insert all, which was the purpose of the runners in the first place, to be useful for two different use cases. Before updating the runner's table for any anticipated updates in the upsert, this would happen because blockchains are eventually consistent. We can tell that what the consensus of the eventual consistency is can switch, and so we we're not sure if the actual insert or upsert of the blocks will fix it. So we invalidate everything that might be wrong. So we don't get in a case where we're, we think two forks are both the one that's winning. And after the table updates to denormalize any data, this was denormalization to make the actual UI fast. With all our validation and multi-run separated by table, we could declare the data dependencies with a simple list for the order. This is 13 tables in one transaction and we ran into issues with transactions timing out after two minutes. This was so bad that like, I took two weeks trying to solve this problem where like, I got up to like, I kept eliminating more and more problems and it would run for like 
up to an hour, and then it would hit a problem with like a 10 minute timeout. And like, it's ridiculous. New blocks come in every five minutes, to f uh, every five seconds to 15 seconds. Two minutes for like, to get a new block in was ridiculous. Most of the timeouts were due to either inserting addresses or Postgres implicitly holding what it calls a share lock to ensure foreign keys remain valid when inserting into tables that reference addresses. You could run into a similar problem if you have a lot of tables that have uh, foreign key references to your user table or your account table, et cetera. We need a way to break up the transaction. Thinking through the problem, we realize that although addresses with no data aren't very useful and somewhat confusing, like, OK, here's my address. Why don't I have any transactions? I know I spent money. Them being in the database and then the application crashing leaves the database still in a recoverable state. Since we could separate address upserts, we need a way to represent the separate transactions using the import runner behavior. I add a layer above called import stage that is allowed to consume one or more runners. I say it tracks the consumption because this way we could make sure that when we rearrange the pipeline that we don't leave one of the runners on the floor that never gets consumed. Importantly, a stage, unlike a runner, can, split, can spit out a list of multis, which means we can chunk the problematic slow updates into separate multis and therefore separate DB transactions to beat the timeout. The way I thought about this is that I knew that the Linux kernel used to have a problem with global locks. And the way they got around this was making the locks smaller and smaller. So I'm like, how can I make the locks that I take in the database a smaller and smaller period on a smaller and smaller number of tables while still getting the throughput we want? To use the, the stages, we collect all the multis and then run them in their own transaction while we don't hit an error. Again, we could have like let the, collect the errors validation style and kept going, but we didn't want to have to deal with how to break up the data dependencies for the later inserts that depended on these addresses. So we just bail and retry. Breaking up the transactions got us past the timeout problem, but we were still seeing a lot of activity in Postgres. One of the uh, PIDs in like the PG admin view always showed auto vacuum addresses. Auto vacuum runs to gather metadata, such as which tuples are active and the cardinality or approximate row count of the tables. This metadata is used to determine the query plan, such as which join to do first and whether to use an index or a sequential scan. Auto vacuum is critical to keeping Postgres fast, so we couldn't just disable it. And um, I believe too much in database integrity to turn off foreign keys. What we determined was happening is that although OnConflict prevents errors and allows us to do upserts, it is always writing. Even if the address or any other table's row is identical, Postgres does not care. It still writes a new row, which internally Postgres calls a tuple, which shows up in the Postgres log. Thankfully, Postgres and Ecto are once again great. The Ecto query we passed to OnConflict can have a where clause. Only when the where clause is true will the OnConflict write a new tuple. Postgres has a useful operator called isDistinctFrom that can be used to compare the update to the old value. isDistinctFrom is better than not equals because it does not propagate null. So you can get a Boolean value when comparing null with itself and null with non-null values to detect change. If you did not equals and null was returned, the where wouldn't know what to do. isDistinctFrom also works on tuples. So Instead of chain together fragments with or, we can use a single fragment with one is this thing from for all columns. The only downside is that it gets very long and is purely positional, so it's very easy to mess up the column names matching between excluded and the actor columns. I eventually just used Vim to copy one and like into three places because I kept screwing up and having off by one errors because this is like 17 columns. Using is this thing from with a tuple format has the advantage that you're sending a smaller query to the server though. This was important because we ran into issues with sending too long of query strings or like the binary format since Postgres uses the binary protocol and not the textual protocol. We actually had to limit our inserts to 500 rows to prevent exceptions due to the buffer sizes in Postgres. So the final version of the ETL process. Ensure only unique params are getting to the load step using maps or map set with explicit merge rules that match the updates in your extract step. Validate the params and extract the valid changes from the change sets. Order the inserts across tables so foreign keys are guaranteed to reference existing primary keys. Break up the inserts into transactions that will insert into a reasonable amount of time to prevent timeouts, but still allow recovery on reboot. 
recovery and reboot is not just crashes in production. This is also you just messing around and doing Control C, Control C on IEX and not wanting to have to completely kill your database because you can't recover when you restart IEX in development. Using multi-run to group operations across tables into a single transaction. For each insert or update, sort the changes to prevent deadlocks. When inserting, use on conflict to upsert. Don't use replace all, but instead use an ecto query for better than last right win rules, which can use excluded to refer to the new row. To prevent slowdowns due to auto vacuuming, use the where clause on on conflict queries so you don't write rows unless a change has actually occurred. Ecto can be used with or without a database. Without a database, Ecto changes can be used for validation, but for more pervasive type validations and casting, you can use Ecto type directly. With the database, Ecto migrations allow you to access to the full power of Postgres indexes, types, and constraints without having to drop down to executing SQL strings. Ecto type can help with, data, with a database by allowing your Elixir type to be richer than your Postgres type, as you saw with the hash type versus the raw binary that the database is storing. Ecto multi can help with ETL processes by allowing the the code to use one DB transaction and have it be contributed to by multiple Elixir functions and modules in charge of different business rules. When the logic becomes too complex for insert all, multi-run is an escape hatch to allow pre and post processing around the insert all. To convert those insert alls to upserts, on conflict can be used. Replace all works, but using Ecto queries for specific business rules is better. To improve the throughput of the upserts and lower write load, use a where clause so that only change rows are written. If you have any questions, you can contact me by email or on Twitter or Elixir Lang Slack at Chronic Death. I am the host of the Austin Elixir Meetup here in town uh, on the third Monday of the month at Capital Factory. If you're interested in working with me, you can contact Dockyard with the higher link or email me directly or I'll get you in touch with our sales department. If you're interested in IntelliJ Elixir, you can download IntelliJ Community Edition for free. Plugin install happens inside the IDE, but you can also view plugins in the JetBrains plugin repository, and the source for the plugin is available on GitHub.